Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong. Thank you for joining our program this evening called The War in Ukraine, A Grave Miscalculation. We're sharing tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the UChicago Yuen campus in Hong Kong. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. I also encourage you to visit the UN campus website at www.uchicago.ha and subscribe to our e-news for the latest UN campus programs and information. Or you can follow the UChicago UN campus Hong Kong social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our new channel on LinkedIn. We'll wrap up tonight's program with a poll and more information about upcoming events, so be sure to stay tuned until the very end. In late February, Russian President Vladimir Putin sent Russian troops into Ukraine, sparking the greatest land conflict in Europe since World War II. Our guest tonight is Professor Konstantin Sonin, John Dewey Distinguished Service Professor of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. Professor Sonin was on sabbatical in Russia when Russia invaded Ukraine at that time. He left 10 days after the war began. Tonight, Professor Sonin will share a brief talk and provide an overview of the current situation and take your questions. Professor Sonin's research interests include political economics, development, and economic theory. His papers been, have been published in leading economics and political science academic journals. In addition to his work, Professor Sonin writes a column for V Times and a blog on Russian political and economic issues. You can follow his Twitter account at ampersand K underscore S-O-N-I-N. Welcome, Professor Sonin. Let's get started tonight by having you share your presentation with the audience, and I'll come back and facilitate some questions. Thank you. So uh, today I will talk about the war in Ukraine. I will talk more about the origins of conflict, not about what is going on right now. One reason for this is that the situation is still developing and it's, it's difficult to, it's difficult even to forecast how this might end. So let me begin with a very brief observation of what is Ukraine and Russia today and what is Ukraine and Russia historically. So if you look at the map, then Ukraine is a very small, is a very small country and Russia is huge. But actually, Ukraine is not that small. It's uh, as a landmass, it's the largest European country, same for the European part of part of Russia. So the population of Ukraine is 44 million people and Russia 140 million. So the difference is four times. Russia is not only richer in terms of GDP naturally because it's a much larger country, but it's also richer in GDP per capita. Uh, Russia is about ten thousand dollars in two thousand twenty. This is this corresponds roughly to the um, to the uh, poorest countries among among the riches. And Ukraine is just a poor country, so the GDP per capita is three times smaller than Russia. Ukraine's capital, Kiev, we'll see it uh, in my presentation has 3 million people. It's the seventh largest city in Europe. So it's a relatively huge, uh, huge city. The capital of Russia is Moscow, which is the largest city in Europe with 12.4 million people, one of the largest cities in the world. So the Ukraine and Russia, as many European, European countries, have a shared history. So back 1,000 years ago, Kyiv was one of the largest European cities and Moscow was uh, just non-existent. It was a deep periphery of European civilization. It was just forests, um, forests north of Kiev and Rus. Fast forward 500 years ago, Kiev, a large city would have been Greater Lithuania or Poland, or at some point it was an independent country. And Moscow is the largest city of the emerging Russian uh, Tsardom. Fast forward 20, 200 years uh, after that, Kyiv, a large city within the Russian Empire, and Moscow, the capital and the largest city of the empire. Then again, another 300 years, these two countries again become independent. They were also briefly independent from each other 
in the early 20th century. So Kyiv, the capital in Ukraine in 2000, Moscow is the capital of Russia. So you see historically, um, you could say that Russia was a part of the Kievan Rus and Kievan Rus was a part of Russia. Again, this is not something, uh, this is something that is, um, that might look unusual for say American students, but it's quite, quite standard for um, for Europe, for those who know the history of Europe. So the last time Ukraine and Russia became two independent countries was 1991 when the Soviet Union was dissolved. Since then, now for these 30 years, Ukraine is a competitive democracy politically, meaning that incumbents run in the elections and lose the elections to opposition. Actually, Ukraine is one of the most competitive democracies in the world, so incumbents lost elections uh, four times out of six times um, in, in this 30 years, 30 years history. There was one uh, president who, uh, who was elected in 2010 and lost power in 2014. I will talk about this episode later because it's very important to what is going on now. Ukraine also has uh, competitive parliamentary elections, meaning that for all 30 years, all kind of uh, all kind of opposition, including very radical opposition to the sitting president, was present. Uh, were running in the elections and were present in the elections. Ukraine has had largely free media before the war, save for the restrictions on the Russian media, which are translated into Ukraine in the last in the last eight years. But again, uh, there is a whole representation of the political spectrum in Ukraine media. The current president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, uh, won in 2019, and uh, he defeated the incumbent president, the sitting president, with 73%, 73% of the vote. In a big contrast, Russia's personalistic dictatorships. So in the brief history of independent Russia since 1991, incumbents have never lost elections, actually, in 1,000 history of Russia, incumbents never lost elections, though back 25 years ago, it was possible that the opposition would control a parliamentary majority. But for the last 23 years, it's just a personalistic, a personalistic dict dictatorship. So Vladimir Putin is the president who never, who for the last 20 years never participated in the competitive elections. No one is allowed to run against him uh, seriously. Media are tightly controlled, so if you say something wrong, the media is closed, the editor uh, would go to jail, into exile, the political opposition is either jailed or pushed out, out of the country. So the last significant point in the recent history, of course, there, are, there is a history of there are different episodes throughout uh, a thousand years, but the salient and important point was the conflict in 2014. So 23 years after the peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union. There were some um, reasons to have tensions after the dissolution of the Soviet Union because Crimea, it's a peninsula on the southern border of Ukraine, is typically considered a historical part of Russia, but it became a part of Ukraine, again, because the dissolution of the Soviet Union was peaceful. So what was the arbitrary borders within the Soviet Union suddenly became state and nation borders. Then millions of Russian speakers were left in Ukrainian territory. And sometimes people make um, a strong argument that Russians are the same people because they speak the same language. Uh, I need to say just a footnote that the fact that um, there are two groups of population speaking the same language in different countries doesn't mean that this is the same country. For example, in Great Britain and the United States, people speak the same language, but this is not the same country. Moreover, in Philippines, which has never been a colony of any grand power, say for Spain, most people speak English rather than uh, local, local Tagalog. This does not mean that it's in any sense a part of the British Empire or a former part of the British Empire or uh, a part of the United States. So again, although there are millions, we have tens of millions of Russian speakers 
in Ukrainian territory does not mean that there is a kind of a special claim um, arising uh, to that, that there is a special reason to call these people Russian, they're Russian speakers. So in 2014, there was a big domestic uh, conflict over the European Union accession in Ukraine. So basically half of the country wanted the European accession more than a half. Uh, a strong, um, strong big minority didn't want. So it led to a bloodshed in the capital and the removal of President Yanukovych. President Yanukovych ordered troops to shoot on the peaceful protesters. And as a result, he was abandoned basically by, um, by basically the whole political spectrum, even those who supported him before um, before the bloodshed, uh, they uh, stopped supporting him, he left country, so there was a sort of domestic turmoil. Uh, starting from the day one of this domestic turmoil, Russia started to uh, get involved, so it first peacefully occupied Crimea, peacefully meaning that Russia introduced troops into Crimea, and then Ukrainian troops in the Crimea basically switched to the Russian side, so this was this was why it was so peaceful. Then Russia started to provide support to the Russian-speaking separatists in Eastern Europe. These were people who were local, who were loyal to the previous President Yanukovych. So it was sort of a civil conflict. And then, as a result, it allowed them to create, with Russian military support, an independent enclave in the east of Ukraine. So if you look, um, if you look here, this is the map of Ukraine. This is, uh, this is Crimea, which became a part of Russia uh, in 2014. And this is this uh, independent, independent enclave consisting mostly of Russian speaking people and having, uh, having two, um, two large cities, Donetsk and Luhansk. So basically um, during this blood, during this domestic conflict, which became a sort of local civil war once Russia started to support military, uh, the separatists, there were um, about 15,000 people, a lot of them, peaceful people killed mostly from the Ukrainian side because Russian military was much, uh, much stronger. Uh, anyways, this was a bloody local conflict. So now since 2014, the Russian government was increasingly belligerent. So basically claiming that Ukraine is a natural part of Russia. So this red part should be extended or basic, or may, maybe Russia should have, um, should have a serious influence in the Ukrainian territory. So now, now um, after that, uh, let's compare the military capacity in 2000. 14, so you probably have seen these tables, they became popular when the war started. Basically, this table says that Russia has uh, a strong military advantage over Ukraine. It has the army that is four times larger than, uh, than the Ukrainian army. It has uh, seven times more combat aircraft. It has twice more combat helicopters. It has say, eight times more combat vessels. Russia has the is ranked typically as the second military power in the world. Ukraine is not, uh, is not that weak. It's 21st, um, it's, it, it was ranked 21st as a military power, but of course it's no match to the Russian military power. So the immediate reasons to go to invade, uh, to invade Ukraine were as follows. Over these years, over these years of growing, like of brewing, Mm, I don't know, resentment and both towards Ukraine and the West, President Putin, Putin and his close circle, both inside and outside the government, President Putin spends a lot of time with his close friends, not necessarily members of the government, uh, they formed a very specific worldview, which does not correspond to our worldview, but is pretty consistent uh, in this close um, political elite circle. So what they believe is that Ukraine doesn't have a stable government with a strong support, that President Zelensky is not a serious politician. He was a popular actor, actually a comedian, 
uh, before he turned to politics. And he was actually the most popular comedian in Russia because he's a Russian speaker. So somehow uh, there had never been a serious attitude towards President Zelensky that he's a merely a puppet of local oligarchs, local nationalists, or the United States, that Ukrainian military isn't capable of serious resistance, that Russian troops will be greeted as liberators, that people will welcome Russian troops and Ukraine joining, uh, joining Russia. They came to believe that United States are divided over domestic issues and would not pay serious attention to what is going on in Europe that European countries are decadent and weak and too dependent on Russian gas and oil to provide any assistance to Ukraine. So strangely, these things, all of them were explicitly said by President Putin and his circle. They said this publicly. President Putin even published an article basically saying this. Uh, they also expressed this, uh, this worldview in private. But a lot of, a lot of analysts somehow uh, attached different motives and a different world due to President Putin, although it has been pretty consistent over these years. So it's an interesting question that political scientists might address in the future. How is it possible that people in power, people who maintain power in a huge country, are so ignorant and uh, misinformed? I would attribute this to the general failure of Russian democracy that a person who stays for 20, 20 years and more in power become, becomes sort of degenerate. I mean, the government degenerates. Yeah, these are all readers and they are for, um, for people to discuss. Okay, so on February 24, 2022, uh, the, Russian government, the Russian government decided to launch an aggressive war and this was basically the war went as follows. This is, this is Russia, this is Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine. So the main thrust of the Russian power was towards Kyiv. Also, they sent paratroopers to Kyiv, uh, to Kyiv squares trying to catch or kill President Zelensky. They attacked the second largest, uh, second largest Ukrainian, um, uh, Ukrainian city, Kharkiv. They started started um, land invasion um, from the south, trying to link to link the Russian controlled part here and the Russian controlled controlled Crimea. So this all part Russia. These are the main thrusts. So the world response to this was that most countries in the world condemned the invasion. In the United Nations General Assembly, only four countries supported Russia when the condemnation was discussed. It was North Korea, Eritrea, Belarus, and Syria. Two countries, Belarus and Syria, they're basically, uh, I would say, Russian client states. But by now, they're occupied by Russian troops, so they're not even independent countries. Um, the reasons of North Korea and Eritrea um, are subject to speculation. 38 countries, including China upstate, 150 countries voted to condemn the invasion. In the immediate run-up to the invasion, and since the start of the war, United States, Great Britain, European Union, Turkey, individual European Union members pro provided significant military assistance to Ukraine. So there was it started very late. It started a couple of months before when it became clear, at least to the leaders of these countries, that there is an imminent, an imminent attack on Ukraine. They started to provide significant military assistance, mostly defensive, uh, defensive weaponry. Then, after the start of the war, the United States, Great Britain, European Union, Japan, Australia, many other countries like Canada imposed significant sanctions against uh, Russian government bodies and their resources. The Russian government officials, including top uh, leadership and top um, leaders of the media agencies, and the Russian business elite, including those living uh, living abroad. So this actually significantly affected uh, the Russian economy, but has not resulted in a change of the course. So what could be said um, about one month uh, of the warfare? One thing, one big lesson is that basically the Ukrainian army, which is which is much smaller, although it eventually got military assistance in terms of 
defensive weaponry from the West um, won the Battle of Kiev. So basically, Russia lost an enormous amount of manpower. It's about 10 or maybe 15,000 soldiers, several generals, uh, hundreds of tanks. There are, uh, there are hundreds of prisoners of war. And uh, of course, this is a strong sign that something goes wrong when the attacking side has hundreds of prisoners, prisoners of war. Anyways, after a, um, after a year of um, shelling of large cities, Russian army wasn't able to take Kyiv, wasn't able to take Kharkiv, wasn't able to take the city of Mariupol, which is completely destroyed by now. It was able to take the city of Kherson here, but it's one of the, it's um, even not top 20 largest city, city in Ukraine. So of course, Another important feature is the massive, uh, massive human toll on this invasion. So there are uh, dozens of Ukrainian cities which are destroyed either completely or partially because the Russian military either unwilling or unable to um, target precisely military targets as the laws of war would suggest thousands of Ukrainian civilians killed. So the toll of 2000 is perhaps uh, an undercount, including 150 kids. So these are uh, portraits of five of these kids that were killed. This was provided by the wife of President President Zelensky. Four million Ukrainian refugees are now in neighboring countries, and about 15 million Ukrainians are um, replaced. So basically, a third of the country <clears throat> had to move because because of the invasion. Half of this. 4 million refugees in neighboring countries are children. So here you see the kids um, sheltering from the bombing in a, a Kyiv uh, uh, subway. Um, more than 10,000 Russian and thousands of Ukrainian soldiers are killed. There is less information about the Ukrainian soldiers killed, but it should be a smaller, a smaller number. I remember being particularly striking by uh, the death of this girl, who was a um, student in a uh, in a mathematics department in the National University in Ukraine, and before in the math she studied in the math mathematical school, and she taught mathematics to Kharkiv children when the war started, and then decided not to leave. And basically, because the first twenty years of my life looked almost exactly like like hers, but I lived up to fifty, and she will. And she and she died uh, and she died um, young and of course after I wrote about her story I learned that we have uh, we have common friends so this is I mean no question about this this is a war crime and it's not clear whether the people like uh, President Putin and his entourage will be held responsible there will be something like Nuremberg uh, process for this but there of course should be. So as of now, as of now, uh, it seems that uh, the Russian troops are unable to take to take Kyiv and to take Chernihiv on the north and Kharkiv on the east. So it seems that Russia are withdrawing troops from here and puts its main thrust to occupy this part of Ukraine. So, which is predominantly Russian speaking, Russian speaking, and adjacent, adjacent to Russia, there is a peace negotiation process. But the as of March 30th, uh, it's not clear how it might end. So, it might it's very much might be that we are looking uh, for a prolonged war up until there is a a victory of one side or uh, perhaps a regime change in Moscow. So I'll stop here and we'll take your questions. Thank you, Professor Sonnen. Um, appreciate all the maps. Uh, it really helps uh, the audience understand um, you know, what's going on in the geography and the, the uh, orders of magnitude of each, of each country in the conflict. Um, I'm interested in kind of zooming in from a personal standpoint with you. I mean, you uh, mentioned to us that you left 10 days after the conflict 
had broken out. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about that experience and um, kind of what are, what are things like now in Russia for, for people in Russia and for yourself? Uh, okay, basically after the uh, start of the conflict, uh, gradually, gradually over time, but by now, the Russian government imposed a sort of a martial, martial law. It's not a martial law in all respects, but basically there are extraordinary measures with respect to, say, spread of information. For example, um, most of the independent media, whatever independent media uh, were existent, at February 24th, now they're closed down. So there are no uh, independent media and those media who tries to operate in this environment, they're basically harassed. The journalists are either arrested or put in jail or forced, uh, forced to leave the country. Um, the Russian government also criminalized uh, basically what people say. So if you say on social media that there is a war in Ukraine, this is a crime. You cannot call this war a war. You need to call it a special, uh, special military operation. And basically, whenever you uh, now these days, these days people get punished for saying uh, no to war. People are punished for uh, displaying the word peace. Uh, it's it's sort of hard to believe because like this Soviet propaganda back. In my childhood was basically about how peaceful is the Soviet Union. So the word peace was everywhere. But now, if you display the word peace, you are fine. If you do this the second time, uh, you are arrested. And um, basically, basically, I, I was when I was in Russia, when I was there, when I lived there, or when I was on sabbatical, I was writing columns to newspapers, then newspapers were closed. I was going to a radio channel. The most popular radio station in Russia was independent. Then it was closed um, in early March. Uh, then I went, there was an internet based uh, TV channels. Okay, they were also closed. And when they criminalized uh, not only what you say now, but they criminalized past posts on social media. So people get prosecuted for what they've said uh, a year ago, five years ago, uh, I decided that it doesn't, I mean, I'm not adding anything and I risk a lot, so, so I left. And with all the um, media that's been cut off from the people in Russia, what do you sense is the, uh, is the tone? What's the feeling of support for Putin and for this conflict at this point? Okay, that's very difficult to tell. So one thing is that in an authoritarian country where people punished for expressing their views, where a sociologist could be punished for um, collecting data which contradicts the uh, government uh, the government opinion, it's impossible to have like fully independent sociology. So that not fully independent sociology uh, reports that people are very supportive of the war and very supportive of uh, President Putin. But remember again that the Russian media are prohibited, and this is criminal to mention casualties. It's criminal to mention that people are, are dying, both Ukrainian people. It's, uh, it's criminal to mention that Russian, um, Russian army destroys, uh, destroys peaceful buildings, kills um peaceful peaceful population in ukraine so i i wonder uh, at least there is no um, i mean people are not excited about the war the way they were excited about uh, occupation of crimea back eight years ago it seems that a lot of people have doubts now that the prices um for many basic products rose 20 to 30 percent 50 percent in in one month, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. For now, it seems that there is no popular discontent with the war. We'll come back to the uh, sort of the economic situation in Russia with some of the questions that have come in. You know, um, there's no question that we, there's a, you know, a single actor and a single government that has taken this war into Ukraine, but we do have one audience member and there's been a lot of discussion in the United States and other parts of the world 
about who bears responsibility for this, this conflict. Um, you know, some would say that uh, the West, you know, um, baited uh, Ukraine with NATO, and that was just a line, a red line for Putin that he couldn't couldn't tolerate that any further. What well, What are your thoughts on who bears responsibility if you look at it prior to the conflict starting? Of course, of course, Russian propaganda, both domestically and internationally, makes a lot of um, a lot of noise about NATO being somehow responsible, Ukraine being somehow responsible. But the fact of the matter is that NATO never attacked Russia, Ukraine never attacked Russia. There had never been a single Ukrainian soldier on Russian soil. They never did anything aggressive, never in their history. So it's the Russian army that shells uh, large, uh, large Ukrainian cities. It's the Russian army that like the Russian tanks that are uh, everywhere on Ukrainian borders. It's the Russian army that kills, uh, kills civilians and, um, and, bombs, and bombs roads. So uh, like, I understand, I understand this argument that not NATO or United States or whoever is responsible. But if you look at the facts, it's the Russian army that uh, attacks Ukraine and this aggression was totally unprovoked. So, I mean, it's it's an interesting, these are interesting words, but they do not correspond to the reality. Mm -hmm. um, one of our audience members um, wanted to know, and I appreciate the background you gave on the historical relationship going back um, so far. Um, one of the audience members wants to know if uh, Putin's actually targeting natural resources in Ukraine, or is this conflict more uh, cultural and historical, as you kind of laid out in your presentation. Okay, I, I would say that most of the intelligence failures and experts failures about interpreting President Putin, uh, Putin uh, decisions and actions with respect to Ukraine, basically their ma main failure was trying to attach some rational, uh, rational motive for this. Of course, Ukraine is a large country which is rich with natural resources. But Russia is far richer than any other country in the world in terms of natural resources. Whenever you look at the absolute values or relative values, R Russia is extremely rich with natural resources and has natural resources to, to explore for hundreds of years. So of course, you could think that Russia wants to take uh, the, coal, uh, the coal of Donbass or the Oil, fee, oil fields, potential oil fields of uh, southern Ukraine, but Russia has so much oil and coal and everything, and so much unexplored areas that it's sort of, it's sort of like Russia should be the least, the least country, uh, the last country to try to get more natural resources. Also, also, I would say that thinking about natural resources, that's something important. And for some countries, the lack of natural resources is a salient issue. But even before the war, the total value, total capitalization of all Russian resource com uh, companies, like including Gazprom, the largest gas producer, or the oil companies, the total capitalization was smaller than that of Apple or Facebook or Google which doesn't, do not have any natural resources. So I, I would say that the natural resource issue overrated in general, and also Russia certainly does not need any, um, any, any others natural resources. There's also been a lot of um, talk in the news about, um, with Putin's words about denazifying uh, Ukraine. Can you speak to the kind of the history and the background of that issue and how relevant that is to all of this? Okay, that's uh, that was a kind of a sad, um, sad spectacle for uh, those who know history, uh, history, the European history, because unfortunately, the President Putin words on the day of invasion, basically his speech that uh, that explained the rationale for this uh, invasion, it was it was following very closely to what Adolf Hitler the German Chancellor said when Ger Germany attacked Poland on September 1, 1939, starting the World War II. 
So basically, there is a narrative that President Putin pursues that there are some nationalists in Ukraine, that there is some persecution of Russian language speakers. Of course, every country has a share of nationalists. Every country might have national tensions, but in the history of Ukraine, there had never been any kind of uh, organized oppression of Russian speakers. I mean, Russian speakers is more than one third of the a third of the country. They have always had political uh, representation. Nationalists, those who are um, who get disproportional attention on Russian TV, they actually run in Ukrainian elections, and they did about two percent in the elections in which President Zelensky eventually got seventy-three percent. So, I mean, speaking of any real nationalists in uh, Ukraine, there are. They never had any influence, they've never been in the government, unlike, unlike in Russia, which I think now has um, people who are like ideological heirs of Hitler in the government. As you know, we're sitting here in, um, in Asia and a lot of our questions coming in have to do with the, um, the response or lack thereof of China and India and other countries in Asia to the war. Um, do you have any thoughts about you know, what you're hearing about China and India's response? And, and then as a follow-on question to that, how do you view the war's impact um, ultimately, maybe too early to tell, on Russia, China, India, US geopolitical and geoeconomic dynamics? Um, okay, in, in Russia, there are a lot of talks about the turn to the East um, because of the sanctions, because of the tensions of the West, because of the perceived hostility from United States, European Union, and Great Britain. Um, there are, of course, some problems with the turn to the East. And one problem is that, uh, that uh, Russia is a very standard, very standard European country by history and by everything. So it's not that easy for a European country. Like it's, it's almost as natural as a turn of Italy or Spain to, uh, to the East. But perhaps more, more importantly, in Russia, it, it's sort of, it might sound strange, but there is a kind of a paternalistic view of China. So China, for some reason, is considered in Russia as sort of, um, I don't know, uh, without, without disrespect, like a younger brother of Russia of sorts. So people talking about what would China do and whom would China support without realizing that China's GDP is uh, five to six times larger than Russia. So Russia is a relatively small country and relatively a small trade partner. I think China in general geopolitically is a big beneficiary because Russia is one of the China rivals. And as a result of this invasion, uh, Russia is drastically drastically weakened. Basically, every uh, Chinese business that deals with Russia, the Chinese government dealing with Russia, the Chinese state companies and banks dealing with Russia, they just got got the upper hand. Their bargaining power has improved. They now have they will have going forward almost a monopoly position on trade. So the Russia will have to sell oil and gas with a larger discount than before. And basically the same goes, uh, goes with India, but India is just, in this respect, is just a large country. It's not an active geopolitical player. That ties a little bit to um, some of the questions that have come in around um, how Europe is going to deal with um, the loss of flow of energy coming in from Russia. Um, do you expect the U.S. to make up for the shortfall? Okay, before, before, before the war, this was a major issue, and I think this was a major argument for President Putin um, in favor of attacking Ukraine, is that Europe is so, is so much dependent on Russian gas, and to some extent to oil, on a less extent to on Russian oil, that it will not be doing anything. For example, 40 40% of the gas that Germany consumes uh, is, is Russian gas. So it seems that the Europe's, uh, Europe's willingness 
to uh, use Russian gas is directly linked to what they see on the battleground. So initially, before the war, there was no like wide consensus in Europe that uh, Europe should go through hard times, like um, have a colder, a colder houses, having higher taxes on, on gasoline uh, because of the Russian belligerence over U towards Ukraine. But now, when everybody sees the shedding of the uh, large European cities, the whole destruction of the country, tanks on the Ukrainian roads, when they see millions of refugees, and now like the, um, the uh, population of Warsaw, the capital of Poland, it, 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 can, it increased 15% over a month because there are so many millions of Ukrainian refugees in Poland. There are hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees in Germany, even countries distant as Italy, Spain. Now the United States will have hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees. So given the scale of this human tragedy and dealing with the fact that there are a lot of refugees, it seems that the European countries are willing to make huge sacrifices with respect to a current well-being. So I think the total ban on Russian gas import is on the table. So if hostilities continue, uh, Europe will just stop um, consuming Russian gas and paying uh, paying Russia. And gas and oil import is about uh, 45, 50 percent of the Russian uh, of the Russian GDP. So this will be a huge a huge blow. And also already already uh, there are big changes in European. Uh, policy towards the oil and gas consumption. And I think in a couple of years, they will be totally independent of Russian gas and oil. I think the United States will try to um, fill the market. They cannot do this immediately. So the immediate effect will be the rise in price. But eventually, uh, if eventually all the consumption of gas and oil in Europe will be replaced by Middle East and uh, American American production. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about sanctions uh, more in depth and what impact they're having on Russia, on their ability to maintain their economic status in the world and on the people uh, on the ground. Do you have any sense of how sanctions are impacting the, the average Russian person? Uh, okay, first I need to say that sanctions, these are not, they're not missiles, this is not a war. Economic sanctions cannot have immediate, cannot have immediate impact, even if there were like a literal, literal iron curtain around Russia, still there will, a lot of what Russia consumes is produced inside Russia, so Russia will not immediately like reverse to the Stone Age, but certainly the uh, sanctions that are currently in place they are totally inconsistent with any kind of economic development, right? So under the sanctions that Russia has now, it will never be able to return to the levels of 2021. We know this um, having observed the experience of Iran. Um, Iran, you know, Ira Iranians today, they have lower GDP per capita than they had under Shah, the pre-revolutionary government 40 years ago in part this is because of the revolution and the uh, and the subsequent war but in part it's the result of sanctions that why iran is um going is doing such hard things to get under the sanctions so one thing about sanctions against russia it's totally incompatible with economic development it's impossible to economically develop to develop there will be uh, there is the, the, you will need to have reforms that will um, integrate at, to least, at least to some extent Russia back to the world market. But also there is an immediate impact of sanctions. Again, they're not killing the Russian economy, but they're certainly affecting ordinary people. So the prices went up. The price for sugar went up 50%. The prices for most, uh, for most vegetables went up 20%. And this is over the period of this is over the period a month. So it's an extremely extremely high inflation. Of course, sanctions hit uh, the middle class because people can no longer 
travel abroad, they can no longer buy new cars, buy new gadgets, things like this. But it's hit the poor even harder because the food inflation is high because of the sanctions and uh, and the poor people obviously spend more uh, more on food as a share of their income than the middle class. So R Russia is not like killed or destroyed economically as a result of the sanctions, but it's hit hard. The quality of living already went down and will go down even further. And without lifting these sanctions, um, it's not clear that there could be return to um, any kind of significant growth. I know you mentioned the, uh, the math student in Ukraine that was killed. Um, we have many questions coming in about the humanitarian crisis. You mentioned 4 million people uh, leaving Ukraine um, for other bordering countries. Um, can you elaborate on that humanitarian crisis? Like, how is Poland and how are the other countries dealing with um, this massive inflow of people? Uh, okay, countries uh, countries that are Ukrainian neighbors, regardless of their previous history of Ukraine, they, uh, I mean, in, in Europe, it's uh, it's not uncommon to have hostile uh, hostile neighbors. I mean, hostile histor historically and have a history of historical tensions between neighboring countries, but it seems that both the European Union as a whole and countries that are neighbors or not so close neighbors, they do a lot to accommodate, uh, accommodate Polish, uh, accommodate Ukrainian refugees. So basically they admit them without any kind of uh, any kind of visas or anything. So they admit, uh, Poland admits basically um, everyone who wants to go there, they are provided with food and shelter and they will be, Poland is issue, for example, is issuing social security card for Ukrainian refugees. So, um, I mean, you could say for the humanitarian crisis of this scale, this is like historically the best, the best response of um, neighboring countries. But again, this never happened. This kind of thing uh, has not happened in Europe for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure we get to some key questions here, um, and one of them is: um, Is do you think Putin is contemplating an exit? Um, and backing down, uh, and the other the other part of that question is what what would an off ramp look like for Putin if we were to want to sort of um, you know play this out and and have him back out of this conflict at this point? Okay, it's it's sort of difficult to predict what President Putin is going to do because basically what I said what what he does is not rational. It's not um, not only it's not in the best interest of Russia, it's even difficult to explain how it could be uh, could be in the best interest of him or his uh, or his friends. So it's that's why it's difficult to predict what he's going to do. I think that he will double down. And basically, that was his strategy. You know, President Putin is a person who was extremely lucky, uh, lucky politically, meaning that whenever he doubled down, he typically had his opponents blink. This time, neither Ukraine nor uh, the Western community is blinking. So um, I think uh, he will escalate, uh, escalate the assault. But the problem is that it does not seem that the Russian military is just capable of um, defeating Ukrainian army. It's just... It seems that Russia's uh, Russian army was uh, unprepared. It was um, it was unexpected that the Ukrainian army is so well trained and offers such uh, stiff resistance, and that Ukrainian civil population is supportive of um, of President Zelensky, regardless of whether they vote in the even in the areas in which. He didn't have a lot of support in elections. It seems now that he has a lot of support, and the uh, Russian troops and the Russian temporary administration do not get 
a lot of support. So I think Putin will double down, but eventually um, the Russian army will not be, I mean, it will not be defeated. It's still a huge army, but it will lose its fighting capacity as an attacking force. And with mounting economic tensions, Putin will have to settle for something like uh, a certain withdrawal uh, of troops from Ukraine, maybe not from all of the territories, but for example, along um, from the, maybe uh, there will be a peace settlement in which Russia keeps the occupied, occupied temp territory and stays under sanctions. And I mean, God blesses Rus Russian people because this will just mean more repressions uh, inside Russia, but this will at least be a temporary, temporary settlement. So I think it's possible that there will be some uh, pe peaceful withdrawal, but not all of the Russian troops and certainly not from the previously occupied territory. So this could be concrete only by force and the Ukrainian army, as of now, it doesn't have any kind of attacking capacity. Many of our audience members, and I have to ask the question, um, you know, want to know how far Putin will go and would he use um, WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, biological or um, nuclear? Um, is that, do you think that is something that he would ever contemplate? No, I think he, he contemplates things like, like this. And basically like if we were uh, living in the rational, uh, rational world, then I would say, of course, of course, he wouldn't use uh, nuclear nu uh, nuclear weapons against Ukraine. He will not use nuclear weapons against NATO countries. Against Ukraine, it doesn't it doesn't make much sense because the only thing that you could um, get using nuclear tactical nuclear weapons is that you will destroy more of the more of the civilian population. It doesn't give you a military advantage in circumstances like this. Military uh, attacking NATO with the nuclear weapons is sort of suicidal. So it's not rational, it doesn't bring any benefits. But then again, if Putin were rational, he would never invade Ukraine in February 2022. Is there any way somebody was uh, asking a question about uh, a Russian spring happening? Um, with all of the people that Putin has imprisoned who have spoken out against the war, um, is there any way that something like a Russian spring, quote unquote, could happen in Russia? Okay, I, I would say uh, one thing. I do not know whether this is optimistic or pessimistic take, but regimes like Putin, personalistic dictatorships, they, uh, I mean, they always end in a sort of a revolution or a coup. These kind of regimes, they do not transit peacefully to the next, to the next regime. So uh, I'm pretty sure that eventually Putin will, um, will be out of power. It might be like a natural death like Stalin's or it might, or it might, be, it might be cool like it happened to uh, Russian leader Nikita Khrushchev. It might be revolution like it happened in 30 years ago in Eastern European countries, but it will not be, in a sense, uh, in a sense, a peaceful, a peaceful transition. So uh, the question is how early, I mean, how long would it take for this to happen? Okay, I'm pretty, pretty pessimistic about this. And one thing is that although there are sides of support of what Putin does in like sociological research, uh, the Putin's regime does not rely on this support. He, uh, his regime relies on, on repression and fear and the sheer size of the um, uh, politic of the repression apparatus. So you could look at North Korea, you could look at the Belarus, which is a, a Russian neighbor. Basically in Belarus, we, we have a pretty good sociology. Everybody hates, uh, hates Lukash, uh, president leader or whatever. Uh, the leader Lukashenko, when there were a sort of free elections. He got uh, perhaps 15% against the nominal nominal opposition candidate. So he's totally unpopular, but there are so much money spent on the security forces. There are so many 
security forces. There are so many people in jail, tortured, beaten, forced out of the country that this keeps him in power. So I think the staying capacity of Putin uh, is, is actually high. So he, I think he will last uh, a couple of years, but but a decade will be will be tough. I, 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 I'm pretty sure he will not last for a decade. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of Americans and probably Westerners um, have uh, speculated that Putin would use cyber warfare um, as part of a second tier uh, to get the West to back off, to get the US to back off. Has there been any evidence of that so far? And if not, why not? Okay, there is some there is some evidence. There is certainly cyber attacks that come from Russia, or at least attributed uh, attributed to Russia and major American companies. Just today, Google complained that uh, they experience a major cyber attack that they attribute attribute to Russia. Uh, the thing is that Russia might might have a pretty strong cyber forces, but they're not much to the United States cyber forces. I think that if there is a full cyber response from the United States, then uh, just the internet in Russia will go off. So it basically will paralyze everything that Russia has. So I think the fear that a large cyber attack will um, result in a cyber and massive cyber uh, retaliation, that's what basically stops, um, stops Putin. Hmm. We're coming to the top of the hour here, so um, we're probably going to have to wrap up um, with, you know, just a couple other questions. I, one thing that's on my mind is, you know, if this conflict can be resolved peacefully, how do we go back to some state of normalcy with the humanitarian crisis that's going, that's taking place now? You know, how does that I mean, do Ukrainians move back and rebuild? Is it that simple? Um, and then uh, in Russia, you know, do we lift sanctions and you know, corporations go back into Russia? Was that going to require regime change in order to do that, in your opinion? I, I'm just interested in sort of the after effect of a war, if we can reach peace at some level, um, and how we can resume some sense of normality in both countries. I, I hope there will be a peace, and I hope it will be there uh, there soon for uh, Ukrainians. And I think that even if they lose a part of the territory, once there is a relatively stable, peaceful settlement, there will be a huge effort by the world community, by the Western community, to invest in U Ukraine to have a massive Marshall Marshall Plan for Ukraine. And since Ukraine is not that large as Europe after World War II. Um, it will be much easier to have this kind of martial, martial plan. So we know from the history of Japan and the history of Germany after the World War II, and they actually lost not only, not only their cities and buildings and roads, they lost uh, tens of millions uh, people in the war, but they were rebuilt very um very successfully and quite quite fast so there was a german miracle there was the japanese miracle there was the italian miracle i am pretty sure that it's totally realistic to have uh, the ukrainian miracle as of now most of refugees 90 percent of refugees say that they want to return if there is growth if there is a marshall plan they will have additional incentives to return and I'm pretty sure that the European countries will be uh, will be interested in having people in having people to return. Um, uh, so I, I think there will be massive effort, and there will be uh, there will be growth in Ukraine. As of Russia, that's more that's sort of more difficult because if uh, there is a kind of a peaceful transition of power. If there is Putin stays in power or someone like Putin replaces him, then very few sanctions will be lifted, very few businesses will return. So even going back, going back to the 2021 levels will be will perhaps take decades. 
or if there is a drastic regime change, if there is a, I mean, a democratic revolution, not necessarily civil war, but a democratic revolution, which is no, nowhere in sight, then of course there will be more um, openness to lifting sanctions, there will be more openness to business coming back, there will be more investment to Russia. But last time we had this experience, it took about a decade just to stop the fallout because of the, uh, of the political disruption. So it seems that whatever scenario you imagine for Russia, it will struggle for decades to regain what it has uh, before the war. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Professor Sohn, and I hear your phone ringing off the hook. I'm sure there are a lot of people that want to talk to you. I'd like to end the program just thanking you, and um, I like the uh, landing on the word peace uh, in your final comments and miracles, and I hope that we have both. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. I hope you stay in touch and come back and visit us as this uh, conflict progresses so we can get an update from you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Good job. I'm certain the audience members uh, have a much deeper understanding of the situation in Russia and U Ukraine and the impact this conflict is having on the world. I certainly have a deeper understanding this evening. Um, we have a brief poll on tonight's program uh, for the audience on Zoom. If you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, uh, you can leave your answers and the comments. Um, while you complete the survey, let me just tell you about a couple of our upcoming programs. Um, episode three of our COVID Life series will be next Thursday, April 7th at 10 a.m. Hong Kong time. We're going to do a morning program next week. I'm excited about it. We've invited Professor Ariel Khalil, Daniel Levin Professor at the University of Chicago, again, Harris School of Public Policy Studies, to share her recent research on financial security, stress, and inattention in low-income parents of young children under the COVID crisis. So she's got some new research that's just come out and she's gonna share it with us next week. On Tuesday, April 12th, our faculty director, Ken Pomerantz will rejoin us again for a program he'll moderate, which includes three faculty from the University of Chicago and alumnus. They'll discuss how digital tools are transforming the study of East Asian studies, the humanities and social sciences. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and our new LinkedIn channel, as well as our UN campus website for more information about our upcoming programs. Have a great evening. Good night.